Welcome. My name is Rich Crane. I am the founder and CTO of Mill5. A um, little bit of information about me. Uh, you can read some of this. I was at Microsoft for 10 years. Uh, I'm a SQL certified master. No, I'm not a DBA, I'm a developer. I'm the pain in the butt for DBAs. Uh, they both love me and hate me because I knew so much about SQL. Uh, I did graduate from Drexel University and was a professor there for a little while. I wrote this little book about the Windows Communication Foundation. Do not ask me anything about it. I forgot most of it. <laughs> um, um, uh, it was actually a joke internally at my company about that. If only we had somebody to do something about WCF. <laughs> right? um, I did write a really cool article for SC Times, uh, developing high quality code for .NET. And uh, they still to this day say it's one of their best articles. Uh, here's where you can reach me online. So let's get started. Um, all right, what are the odds? Before I get into this, let me ask you, how many people learn by doing? Do you create side projects so that you can say, hey, hmm, how do I actually do that? You know, I have to do it for my work, but you know, let me create this side project and learn myself. I saw two hands. Really? Okay. All right, I see a little bit more. Well, <clears throat> You know, years ago when I worked for Microsoft, I remember I was writing little apps and I would put a time frame on it of say 20 hours and say, how many silly mobile apps can I create in 20 hours? I created 10. And uh, my kids loved it because they would, you know, work on the apps with me. You know, they're real little. One of them, I hate to say it, was a fart app. <laughs> so another one was like a music box app. Another one was Romney versus Obama, right? So you could just go in and tap which person you liked. Uh, interestingly enough, I probably made twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, you know, just in advertisements on silly little apps that took me twenty hours maximum for each app. Well, <clears throat> I extended that to my company. You know, we're a consulting company, so one of the things we always have to be doing is constantly learning, and that's what we do. We always say, "What is the next thing that we have to learn?" And we're always on the forefront. We're always saying. You know, what is it that we do? Big thing at my company right now, you know, the, the number one thing, I was just chatting with Dave here, um, AI, right? That's huge. We've been doing AI for some time, but now it's ingrained in everything that we do. We're actually gonna introduce AI to this very soon. I have some interns starting in a couple weeks and that's what they're gonna do, which is very cool. But let's talk about this little fun app, right? So what are the odds? Um, how many people play the lottery? Really? Only two, three people? Well, that's uncommon. A lot of the population plays the lottery. Why did I pick this? Because a lot of the population plays the lottery. I want to see how much money we can get by creating a little fun app. And at the same time, we're going to create little scenarios so that when my consultants go to the bench and they need to learn things, they do it. So, this app, the whole premise of this is when you go to the store and you get quick fix, you say, I want 10 quick fix. You get the quick fix back and you look at them. Well, see a lot of duplicate numbers, a lot of duplicate mega balls, a lot of duplicate white balls, right? Those aren't the best numbers you could have possibly picked. It was done at random and it was true random. I don't like random, right? If I'm gonna spend $25 or $26 or whatever it is on lottery tickets, I wanna have the best numbers possible. So I said, how do I do that? Pretty simple. You know, you look at how the lottery works and how you win and you pick numbers. Now, does it mean you're gonna win the jackpot? No, that's not the intent. Does it increase your chances of getting a winning ticket for the money you spend? Absolutely, right? So we wanted to create a little app that basically said for Mega Bangers and Powerball, right? We're going to generate quick pick numbers. Um, this is gonna be a community-based app. So our algorithm is community-wide. So if you get quick picks and you get quick picks and you get quick picks, you're gonna kind of be mutually exclusive, okay? 
Why? Because we want as, many as much distribution on the random numbers across the community. Why do we want that? Well, if you go into these convenience stores like 7-Eleven or your local corner store, you walk in there and it says, hey, people here won $800,000 last year. Well, we want to be able to display that on our app. <clears throat> then we want to introduce some things that are traditional gaming type stuff, like gamification. So, hmm, lottery's tomorrow. Have you gotten your quick fix yet? No? Send them a notification. They enter the app. If the lottery's today, maybe the top thing that they see is, hey, the lottery's in three hours, right? Let's, let's go play, right? So that's the whole premise of this. And we wanted to make it a mobile app. And we're gonna support two lotteries at first, Powerball and Mega Millions. Why did we pick Powerball and Mega Millions? Quite simply, they're the largest lotteries in the US. All right, we're gonna pick, uh, I think it's the Super Lotto in Spain. Why am I gonna do that? Well, you know, the next version of this app will have multilingual support, right? We're gonna do some things so that people learn. Now, our premise behind this is to develop a simple Maui-based iOS Android app with a React front end page that's on the internet where you can go and click and download. Well, what do I need to do for that? First off, I don't want to write this app twice. Hence why I picked Maui. Right? Most of my developers are .NET based. So this was a natural fit. We are a Microsoft company. So back end services are in Azure. Some of the things that we integrated with our Azure SQL databases, specifically the serverless stuff. Why? Because I'm cheap. I don't want to pay for infrastructure. <laughs> uh, Azure Functions, and this is going to be the spin up, on demand, consumption based, as well as timing based uh, Azure Functions. And we are looking to use Azure Static Web Ops. Actually, this just went out this past week. Um, we're going to assign the domain to it. But the idea behind this, if you look at this, what are my developers learning? They're learning how to create mobile apps. They're learning how to do both Android and iOS development. They're learning how to use Azure. They're learning how to use React, right? All good stuff. Why would I want to do this? There might be an upcoming engagement with all these things. <laughs> so, okay. So I mentioned uh, cross-platform. This, surprisingly enough, was one of the more harder things that my team had to do. Um, how many people are familiar with designing mobile applications? So a handful in the room. Do you think having buttons on your mobile application is a good thing? Not really, right? Uh, maybe you want areas that you can tap that are naturally something that you can click and, and stuff like that. These, this is actually uh, a mock-up, right? Um, so don't worry about the order button. This is going to come in the future. We're going to actually allow them to buy the lottery tickets online, but you know, for right now we're just supporting the, the quick fix. But <clears throat> the idea behind this is have them learn mobile interface semantics. Something as simple as the travel distance for your thumb is pretty important. I have one of these iPhones, the big iOS Pro Max. Imagine if my thumb had to travel all the way up here. Well, I wouldn't want to do that. That's, that's not good, all right? So they're learning mobile UI design. Um, at the same time, we want to support community-based stuff, but we want to be cognizant of privacy, user identity, we want people to get in there quickly, not, you know, put anything on them. So when they log in, we generate an identifier for them. And when I say they log in, they just open that for the first time. We say, hey, do we know this person? Okay? If we don't know that person, we generate an identifier. We don't collect their name, we don't collect their birthday. We just want them using the app. 
okay? We would generate a random handle for them, you know, something like, you know, cool dude or, you know, wicked programmer or some type of random handle, you know, that's anonymous. Why? Because we have leaderboard semantics on people in the community and we want to be able to show those things, but we don't want to collect your username and stuff. We will generate that identity, we'll generate that handle, and we'll allow them to, to change their name if they so want, because the identity is that unique identifier. Um, lastly, we want to support notifications. Most of our notifications are local-based notifications. Um, we don't want to have any infrastructure like Google Fire, Firebase or you know, Apple's notifications. Um, you know, we would prefer not to have any extra costs or any extra stuff. Uh, most of our stuff is time-based. You know, they play the lotteries three times a week for Mega Millions, three times a week for Powerball. It usually happens, you know, like Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, or something like that. And, you know, we will know what those times are, and then we will set local notifications. Why? <coughs> I just don't want anything on the back end. Okay. So I mentioned serverless infrastructure. Here on the bottom right, you can see how you actually can calculate um, whether you're a winner or not. Well, what we do is you come into the app, you get your quick picks. You can say, I want 20 quick picks, five quick picks. Um, we set the minimum to five because we really want people using the quick picks and we want a large corpus of quick picks. Well, <clears throat> We store those things online. And what we do, after the winning winners are announced, we calculate who won, all right? So we're gonna say across all our users that generate quick picks, who won money, all right? Uh, we do store the quick picks with the, with the unique identifier. A Couple things that we do related to that is when users first go in there, are they gonna win many? Maybe, maybe not. All right? We won't show them if they haven't won money, but we'll show the community stuff. As they start getting more winning tickets, we'll start showing them that stuff. That's part of the gamification. We don't want to show them anything negative. We want to show them only positive stuff. Um, and we'll calculate the average amount for winnings. Well, how are we doing that? Right now, we're storing stuff in a SQL database. Why a SQL database? For Microsoft Shop. We know SQL left and right. We could use Postgres. We might use Postgres, I don't know. But right now, it was just quick and easier to get SQL database. And quite frankly, the functionality is great and it's serverless. And we don't have to access that database all the time, right? We only have to generate, hey, here's all the winning numbers for this lottery. Let's calculate stuff. Let's store that off. And then, you know, we can report that back to the user. So, um, Interestingly enough, how static is this data, right? When I think of data related to an application like this, is it changes very infrequently, six times a week, right? There's two lotteries, Mega Millions, Powerball, three times a week they, they get played. And, you know, once those things happen, it's over, right? So does it make sense to make calls into services and have compute hanging around 24 seven for something like that? The answer is no. <laughs> so that's why you know, we're using a lot of the service infrastructure with Microsoft. Um, you know, that's a generic slide. I'll get into the specifics of what we use in a little bit. But you know, there's some th simple things that we need to do. We need to be able to know when the next lottery is, and we need to know what the past results are. That's it, right? Where we actually need to potentially have dynamic nature of things is when a user wants to look up their history of quick picks, okay? The history of quick picks, caching that across all the users, I don't wanna cache that, right? That would be kind of silly. Um, but uh, that's probably the only one that you know, would probably need to have an on-demand stuff. All the other things are event-based, right? Or time-based, I should say, time-based. So at a certain time, we wake up, 
we go do some things, and uh, we do the calculations, we store off the information we need, and then the application will say, hey, go to a well-known endpoint and download that. So these are the three Azure services that we currently use, Azure Functions, and we support two things, timer-based for periodic execution and HTTP-based for demand execution. Azure SQL Database Serverless. How many use Azure SQL Database Serverless? All right, you're using it, so one person. How many people use Azure SQL Database? Okay, so a little bit more, okay. Um, for us, it's about storing quick fix across the community. And it supports the leaderboard functionality, and on top of that, we want index-based queries. So, for example, we have some functionality, especially in the calculation of did you win or not, right? Where we have to query on each individual ball, right? So, if you're familiar with Power Ball or Mega Ball or Mega Millions. Uh, you typically have five white balls and some either power ball or mega ball. Now, if I had a quick pick, I have to search all five of those white balls. Did any of my quick picks match? And did my power ball or mega ball match? Well, you know, I don't want a document store around this. I just want to be able to say query, you know, match anything within this range. And what's also good is it's time-based, right? So we have a time-based query, and we have a query on the, um, on the balls themselves, and it's fully indexed, right? So that's why we're using a relational database right now. Can we do something else? Possibly, but that was easy and simple. Um, right now, blob storage is supporting the other services, specifically Azure Functions, but we have a thought um, I know we can do this, where um, right now we're caching things whenever possible, or um, we're storing stuff, we're starting to store stuff in blob storage as a well-known endpoint, so we'll take the JSON and put it in blob storage. Why? Because I don't want to pay for compute. But right now you get so many free Azure Functions, and we're early on, that we're hitting the Azure Functions directly. Okay, so for us, hitting the Azure Functions at this point makes sense. Later on, I don't know about you, but I don't want to pay for, for anything. Anybody want to guess how much we spend right now per month, right, on this? You know, just in its base state with, you know, we're hitting it because of our testing and stuff like that. Anybody want to guess what the cost is? $5. Uh, $5, that's close. You said zero? It's not zero, <laughs> right? The SQL database still costs, right? It's less than $10, it's like $8 and some odd cents. And what's interesting is we're in East US 2. I'll talk about that one in a second because we're gonna switch, okay? That's another thing that um, my developers, you know, they provision stuff in East US 2 and then I asked them a simple question. Is that the cheapest region? And they scratch their head and they're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so, all right, um, gamification. All right, um, we're gonna support two types of revenue stream, uh, ad supported and paid monthly subscriptions. Um, listen, this is an entertainment app. This is not a gambling app, this is an entertainment app. This is meant for you to have fun. Um, it is free, but ad supported, right? So if you wanna come in, um, we have inline ads between, um, say, the Powerball and Mega Million stuff. As long as we have an ad on screen, that's all we care about. Um, but if you don't like the ads and want to get rid of the ads, we'll allow you to spend a small amount of money, probably two to three bucks per month. If you want to have a yearly cost, we'll, we'll do like $30 a year or something like that. But the idea here is, how much money would this make? Now, anybody want to guess, you know, how many people play the lottery every week, every single time? Millions upon millions upon millions, and it could be, you know, when the bigger jackpots, it's hundreds of millions, 
okay? Uh, so, you know, when you look at an application and you say, hey, am I gonna learn something? And, you know, if I build something like this, is it gonna get traffic? This will get traffic, right? I know that. It's just a question of how much will you get? I built, um, I told you earlier about my kids and I spending 20 hours uh, I would sit on my couch and I'd build silly little apps. We built a Halloween soundboard app so that, you know, around Halloween time you could have scary ghosts and witches and goblins and things like that. And you just tapped and you played. That thing, you could see the user ramp up in September. You know, get a high on the number of users and then it would increase all the way through Halloween. Okay, you can even see the trending across the U.S. Halloween night. It was wicked cool, but the day after, boom, <laughs> nothing. Right? I told you I built a silly little app uh, when Romney and Obama were running for president. <clears throat> that thing during that, you know, all it was was two little pictures, Romney and Obama, and you can pick and just tap whichever was your favorite candidate. And we would have a community thing that said, hey, Obama's winning, right? You know, that type of thing. Um, that thing was great during the election time, <laughs> okay? Um, this, I think, is gonna be more stable. Why? Everybody plays it all the time. And, you know, we're gonna give them options. Now, one of the key things to our algorithm is picking um, winning numbers, okay? And a winning number is you can win two bucks. That's it. I'm not saying jackpots or anything like that, but the more people win, the more their mindset is gonna be like, hey, I wanna go back and see if I, you know, win some more, do some more quick picks, that type of stuff. So that's how we're gonna monetize that. <clears throat> okay. Here's a little secret sauce on some of the stuff. And yes, we're gonna generate an AI version of this. Um, so we definitely have different algorithms. Right now, the community-based algorithm is, um, we will distribute quick picks. Um, so I said five white balls, one mega power ball type scenario. So we'll distribute the white ball values to ensure duplicates across the, uh, no duplicates. Keywords. No duplicates across the quick text. What we do is we keep a counter of how many times we selected a white ball, and we always select the min on that. So we're always making sure that there's an even distribution across the community. It does increase the chances of a winning ticket. And there's typically 25 or 26 mega power balls. So for us, if you just have a single power ball, We'll make sure that your winning tickets have no duplicates and that there's an even spread on the power balls. Because this is community-based, it means that the more people play, the more winnings we will see from our quick picks. Hence, some of the gamification. Okay. Um, this one's kind of interesting. Um, Maui, I'm finding, doesn't have the best support for some of this stuff. Uh, there is some open source stuff for this uh, out there. There's a plugin for local notifications. We integrated with that. We're not interested at this moment in time because we don't have a use case for uh, true push notifications across either Firebase or Apple network. Um, it's all local. So we do have background support where we're we're injecting local notifications uh, periodically. But the idea here is to attract them back into that. What do people think, if I attract them back into that, what's the benefit to us? Anybody wanna guess? Revenue. Revenue. I get to display an ad, okay? So, I also get to do other things. Like, so for example, one of the debates that we were having just this past week was, 
hey, does it make sense to always show the lottery results as the very first thing in the app? Maybe, maybe not. It makes sense to maybe have a tile that says, hey, you have a few hours away before the lottery, do your quick picks now, right? And allow them to generate their quick picks. The more engaging you can get users, the more they're gonna come back and use your app, okay? The more fun you make it, the more you're, they're gonna use your app, all right? I play the lottery from time to time. Usually I set a limit. I say, I'm not gonna play the lottery unless it's like 100 million on up, okay? That's a feature I think we may or may not put in there because you know there's some people that play the lottery every week. But for me, I only play it when it's 100 million on up. So, all right. So, why do this? Um, how many people have played with Mallet? Okay, so a handful of people. So, um, at Mill 5, we work for a lot of big companies. Uh, I'll just name a few. Olympus, Fidelity, Wayfair. Um, these are just some of the companies we, we do work for. Emerson Electric, okay, so, uh, the idea behind this is if they have needs for cross-platform apps, we need to have that skill set. We just started an engagement on Friday, very big engagement, for a cross, not mobile, sort of mobile, desktop app between Mac and Windows. It does have an iPad component to it, so we'll have to do that. My team is focused on the core architecture. Some really, really, really cool stuff, right? Which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, how many people have multiple skills, right? I always talk about this in, you know, you have to have a major minor as far as your skills, right? You know, you can't be a single skilled person, especially in today's software. You have to know multiple things. So how many people feel like they have an opportunity to learn multiple things? Okay, so I always talk about it from a value perspective. You know, I've had um, people in the past say, I just wanna do this. Well, guess what? If you say that and your company has the need for you to do other things, you just diminished your value. In fact, one of my favorite interview questions is your software development. You have your boss come up to you and they say, hey, I need you to go build this, whatever it is, let's call it a widget. And you know it squarely falls into the realm of software development, but you've never, ever, ever done it before. What do you do? Say yes. Go learn. Go learn. You say yes. I'm gonna tell you some answers from other people that I've interviewed. One person said to me, they said, well, I'll go ask them how to do it. I said, who's that? Oh, my boss. <laughs> I said, they just came to you. <laughs> they don't know how to do it, right? You know, you need to figure out how to do it, right? That one surprised me a little bit, and the person that said it actually surprised me anymore. I, I won't say who. But um, I just laughed. Another person I interviewed one time said, oh, I really love Hadoop. And I was interviewing them, and we had a job to do some Hadoop stuff. And I said, so what are you doing? Nothing. I'm waiting for my boss to give me something to do in Hadoop. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> you know? So, um, it was actually kind of funny in that regard. Um, at Mill 5, we have a requirement that everybody be certified. Uh, we had this requirement before Microsoft uh, made this a requirement for their Microsoft partners. We've had that for a long time. And we're a learning company. We are first and foremost a learning company. Um, we love software development. So for us, it's about learning that next thing being that expert, stepping into the spotlight, okay? Um, 
I'll share with you a story, um, a personal story of mine. It's actually Tyler's father, Craig Dillon, uh, who runs the Worldwide NPCs. This goes back to like 2008 timeframe. Goldman Sachs was coming into Microsoft and they were bringing in trade floor level developers. These developers at the time were considered 1% of the 1% of developers in the world. High performance, you know, high scale, you know, really fast stuff. And I hadn't done that level of programming or things like that. And um, I was really nervous. I, I was like, wow, I don't think I can do this again. That's what was going through my head. And I walked up to my boss at the time, Craig, and I said, I can't do this, I can't do this. And he, he actually calmed me down. And he said, Rich, if not you, who? Those words still resonate with me today. That is a lot about what this is. We're about to embark on an engagement to do some crazy stuff with Mal. Right? I can't get into the details, but it's crazy stuff. Dave knows because he was on the former version of it, but um, some really crazy stuff. Um, at the same time, create passive income app. I'm curious. How much money will this thing make? I know it could probably make more than $20,000, all right? But the question is how much money can it make? I have all these little ideas of passive income apps. You know how I give them to half the time? My interns, right? So we do give back to the community. We do have a good internship program. Uh, we do have people coming in this summer. They're starting in about two weeks. And uh, last year they worked on a product of ours called FinOut which we shipped last uh, December. It it's a product that will compete in some ways against Bloomberg's terminal, which is kind of awesome. Uh, it's built in Teams. Uh, eventually, it'll have a Slack component to it. But now, you know, that one took a long time because there was a lot to it. Now I'm curious about these small little apps, and I have about 10 of them. And I'm like, well, hey, I spent $20,000 on interns, you know, for two interns for the summer. Um, Maybe I can recoup that by having to do these fun little things. Now, what's interesting about it, the interns come, they learn, and they get their certifications. We throw them into the deep end of the pool immediately. It's sink or swim, okay? Now, we'll be the lifeguards on the side of the pool, and we do this for everybody, right? Whether it's our customers, or whether it's our employees, or our interns, We'll be the lifeguards sitting on the side of the pool, ready to jump in if they go in, right? Success, you know, is what we're looking for. Failure is not an option. In fact, I tell my interns, try 10 times, fail nine, succeed one, okay? So we'll see how well this does. But let me talk about some of the things we've learned. Maui. Maui supports different types of navigation within your app. This is a simple app. You should have seen this app three weeks ago. It was horrible. <laughs> Why? Because um, the developers I had doing this hadn't been exposed to mobile applications before. They were exposed to desktop applications, but not mobile. And um, the first versions of this did not look anything like I expected. And then I had to sit back and realize, oh, they weren't thinking the way I want them to. And I would teach them on design, hey, what does good mobile design look like? The other thing is Maui has out-of-the-box navigation, things like fly-out navigation, page navigation, and tab navigation. These things sort of work together, but not really. And if you put these things together, it doesn't look good. Okay, so, um, our first version of this is keep it simple, stupid, right? So kiss, right? Um, but we are in the midst of going to custom and third party um, uh, navigation, right? So Telerk has some really good controls, Synfusion has some really good controls. Um, the only reason I haven't spent the money on it is because I wanna see how much we can do and get back without spending any money or spending the least amount. Um, 
third party controls. First one is the local notifications, right? So the local notifications, there isn't a great abstraction for local notifications with mobile apps with Maui right now, right? There's a local plugin, doesn't support Windows, does support um, you know, iOS and Android, which is good, but I kind of wanted to support Windows too, right? I want to get into the Microsoft Store just for fun, right? Again, to increase our skills. You know, have we built Windows Store apps before? Yes. Have all my developers done that? No. Do I want all my developers to know how to do that? Uh, the majority of them, right? But um, uh, that is something that we're going to be starting to do. In fact, What's really cool is there's some extraction layers we have to build for uh, this upcoming uh, cross-platform desktop app, which will be pretty cool. And we'll, we'll build those abstractions for that customer, but then we'll build um, a more generic thing to cover all the platforms. Anybody know how many platforms Maui supports? Right, we know it supports iOS. Right, so iOS covers iPhone, Android, or not Android, uh, iPad. It supports Android, right? So it supports the Google phones and any Android phone and tablet and things like that. Um, it supports Mac OS and it supports Windows. Is there another one that I haven't mentioned that supports? Yeah, I believe it's Samsung. Yeah, it's Samsung's Tizen, right? And uh, that one is kind of interesting. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that one, but um, we'll see. One of the challenges I have with something like that is ties in, you know, how much am I gonna get from a download perspective? I don't know the answer to that. I wanna do some research on that. But, you know, our goal for this is to support the mobile stuff as much as possible. And because we're a Microsoft shop, um, we'll probably support w Windows and by extension Mac OS. Um, platform specifics. Even in this simple app, this is, a, come on, this is a really simple app, right? I'm gonna tell you right now, even the simple apps have challenges, okay? The platform specific needs for this app are things like Google Play Store and Apple Store because we wanna be in their stores and you know we wanna support their payment models and things like that. The one that was more interesting, and this is what we're finding, and um, we're about to embark on a very high performance desktop app, um, you know, I'll just say in the financial services industry that's cross-platform, there's huge differences in Maui performance, UI performance across the different platforms. So Intel Mac versus ARM Mac versus Intel Windows, it's a big difference, okay? Which do you think is the fastest out of those three so far? Right, so you have the ARM Mac, right, the M1 type stuff, you have um, Intel Mac and you have Intel Windows. Who do you think is the fastest right now? Intel Mac, uh, who said ARM? You were correct. They, for some reason, and we're trying to figure this out, are able to push stuff to the GPU, okay? And we're not sure all the details, it's under the cover, so we're trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, you know where this is an interesting little problem? So we have a quick, I didn't show it on this, these slides, um, mainly because we're, we're, we're almost done, but we're still in development, so I didn't want to show tons of things. But we the quick picks, we will generate all the lottery balls, and um, if you say 20 quick picks, we have to generate all of them. The generation of the 20 quick picks takes just you know 50 to like 120 milliseconds. Surprisingly enough, even though because it's a community-based algorithm, we have to kind of get in there and ensure that there's not concurrency across the community. We have a way to scale that out, by the way. What we, what we do is we round robin distribution to scale out. But right now, since we have very few users, we just have one partition, okay? But we, we load balance across the partitions um, kind of using a proportional fill type algorithm. But um, the drawing is the biggest thing. So when we have six balls, all with numbers, 20 of them, so six times 20, right? What is that, 120 
things that have to be updated, the Maui dispatcher is slow, <laughs> right? It's very slow. And what's interesting about it is we didn't expect it to be that slow. Um, we're dressing that. Um, we actually have to dress it be, um, pretty seriously because um, we're about to embark on a financial app that you know, has those metrics. Um, Azure costs, I have mentioned all the serverless costs, but one of the things I kind of realized about a week ago and kind of set my team off to do is they originally provisioned in uh, US East 2. How many people realize that US East 2 is not the least expensive region out there? Okay, so guess what? I said, delete, recreate on West US 2, okay? That I think is the cheapest for us, but um, you know, we'll see. This last one is an interesting one. Um, how many people have done gamification before? Okay, how many people have and I'm gonna preface this with a few things, like done true UI design, where you have to consider where you place things on the screen, you know, and mobile is a complete different animal because if you don't have something that's easy to use, guess what? Users are gonna stop using it, right? You don't want that. So user interface design is important, how many people have done true user interface design? I'm not talking about putting a text box on a screen and a button, right? Dave, you should be raising your hand. <laughs> so, so about four people, okay? This is hugely important. If, if you're building desktop applications and you don't have a UI-centric mindset, go out and read on the internet. Go out and get a Pluralsight course or something, right? So I had to spend some time um, <laughs> okay, uh, hold on a second, Dave, you're on video, so I'll let you stand up, bring your books, come here. All right. All right. You want to learn about user interface design? You go read my books. <laughs> my software sucks in the Joy of UX. Yeah. And you come to my talk uh, this afternoon. Bring me this room. <laughs> I've known him. How long have I known you? Oh, Jesus, it goes back to common old lady back in, no, holy shit, was that 94? I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's, 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 so, Dave, you, uh, you did teach UI when your first book came out on uh, UI software sucks. Uh -huh. that, is, that is before all this UI stuff. So, why are you, you promoting such a old book? <laughs> because it's still every bit as it's true as it was then. I, it's funny. There's I, not enough people who have read it and, and, and <laughs> listened to it. He, he was at the MTC, the very first one. Oh, in Waltham, and his book just came out, and he was so kind. I still have this book, signed copy, free, given to me by him. Autograph your own damage, take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> so, but look at this. Maui, performance. Maui, navigation. Third-party controls, cross-platform stuff. Platform specifics for mobile applications. Extreme Maui performance issues between different hardware. Azure, how do I build something cheap in Azure? Gamification, how many people have, how many people have ever worked for a gaming company? All right, well, what did you do, I'm curious. Me? Yeah. Um, so I worked at uh, Simutronics, it was online, it was 3D, it was also text-based back in late May. Nice, nice. Yeah, I had, before I came to Microsoft, I worked for a gaming company. Uh, it was about five people. We were stitching together uh, 3D models based on real world data, so vegetation data, uh, building data, streets, maps, and things like that. We had a virtual 3D world, and you could actually drive around. We had two cities, Lexington, Mass, and Boston. You could actually drive around, and it was, it was awesome. We actually, uh, I got to go to the game developer conference you've never been, go. <laughs> it's worth going. But go to the pre-conference sessions because you will learn a style of programming that you will never have gotten in traditional enterprise um, or corporate pro, uh, programming skills. I, I 
I highly suggest it just to put yourself outside, you know, the box. But um, I got the pitch. I was sitting in a hotel room pitching our software to three big companies, Microsoft, Disney, and Sony. Microsoft wanted it for flight sim so that you can actually fly down and see real world data close to the earth, okay? Um, that was the cool part. Uh, but Disney and Sony wanted it for similar reasons for, for, for other stuff. 